Welcome back to a very special draft podcast, 11.1. We said we were going to do it. We, we did it. doing it a little early this week, so we're calling it 11.1, a little addition on to Monday's podcast I did with Sam. Mike Renner here with Steve Palazzolo. We are in New York City at the moment. We'll be doing a live draft show with Sports Illustrated Thursday night. It starts at 745 p.m. Eastern Time, 15 minutes before the draft. We have me, Steve, Albert Breers in studio for Sports Illustrated, uh, Maggie Gray is in studio for Sports Illustrated, and Andy Staples. Those guys will be in one studio. We'll be in the other, giving you analysis on every single pick. You can check it out on sportsillustrated.com or their Facebook page. We think that it's going to be good. It's we think it's going to be fun, yeah. We've got some video breakdowns we can do. Yes. There's going to be unique PFF stats and graphics for all the guys drafted. Mike and I will be giving our reaction and our analysis. It uh, should be a lot of fun. SI.com, Thursday night, just the first round. And be sure to check it out. And we're going to do some live Periscope, too. Yeah. On the Pro best, Football uh, Best draft show of all time. We're already hearing rumors that it might be the best of all it's time. It's going to be huge. It's a huge draft, draft show. We'll see. And, and I'm going to get right into my hot take, and that is that tomorrow and this weekend is the single greatest event in all of sports. The NFL draft is everything that's good about sports. Everyone has hope. Everyone's getting better. Everyone is engaged. To me, it's always falling around my birthday. My birthday is actually the day of the draft tomorrow. It's always been, Tomorrow's your birthday? Yeah, tomorrow's my birthday. Or today, if you're listening, on the 27th. Yeah, the 27th. And it's always just been, to me, the best event in sports because... It just has something for everybody. It's not that hot, Mike. It's not it's, a hot take. I know it's not a hot it's take. Understood. Everyone listening, I feel like, it's is understood. the same way, but I just had to get it off my chest. I'm wishing you a happy birthday right now. If you guys are listening here on April 27th, day of the draft, at PFF underscore Mike, wish him a happy birthday. I already sent it. And your birthday's advance. tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, but a lot of people are listening today, which is the night of the draft. Okay. Or today, Wednesday, the day before the draft. You're really you're confusing listening. people right now. All right. Happy but birthday, though. We're going to do a little rumor roundup, all the guys, the picks that we're hearing. We're going to do that a little later. But the biggest rumors that right now that we keep hearing are about guys just who are going to free fall in this draft. Top 10, top 15 talents who may fall to the end of the first round, may fall out of the first round, or in some cases may not get drafted at all. First guy I want to hit is the one who may not get drafted at all, and that's Gary and Conley. This could be a La L. Collins-esque situation, having his rape allegations this close to a draft. He's obviously refuted it right away, but I just think at this point, what can NFL teams do You know, to to vet that sort of process? There's really nothing you can do. I think he may not get drafted when it's all said and done. Yeah, it's way too close to the draft. Uh, a lot of digging and, and research needs to be done here. Obviously, some serious allegations against Gary and Conley. I think it's fascinating from just an on-field perspective, the cornerback class that I thought could have been six, seven deep yeah. in the first in round. First. You have guys like Tease Tabor running four seven. Sidney Jones gets hurt. Jordan Lewis has off-field. Gary Conley has off-field. Yeah. Who am I missing? All these guys. A lot of bad draft process for some guys that you just don't right. usually see. I think this draft, when it's all said and done, might be known for the number of players that just dropped in the draft Second, number of good players. Yeah, there could be a handful round. of pro bowlers in the second round, which is just rare. And, and I think there will be. And I think, in turn, there's going to be a lot of just guys with clean slates who are good players getting drafted mm-hmm. in the first. Not great mm-hmm. players, but good players drafted in the first. As for Conley, he's screwed. timing's unfortunate. It's not great. Mike just says he's screwed, and that's it. He is. Certainly could be the case. Yeah. Uh, unfortunate if he's innocent uh, uh, there. Uh, another guy here, Ruben Foster... He's not doing himself any favors with basically anything he's done the past two months. Probably the worst pre-draft process I've seen in terms of the amount of things that he's done wrong. Uh, just When the phrase worst interview <laughs> we've ever had yeah. comes up, and it was defined as not necessarily his fault, but the, the total the amount of baggage. baggage right that adds up with his uh, life, career, future... It's uh, there's some risk with Ruben Foster, who we love oh on my the God. field. We it, think he's top on five, the field, top unbelievable, five unbelievable sort of ability. Really, no questions there. And the thing, the crazy part about him for me is you just didn't hear any whispers of him when he was actually at Alabama. At least I didn't hear any whispers. You hear whispers of other guys usually with their off the field stuff. If it's this bad, Nick Saban has good people. 
I, I know, but like you hear, keep that clean. I heard about you know Tim Williams even at Alabama. Other guys coming out of Bama. That's true. With that's true. Unclean slates. That's not the case with Foster, but now it's all coming to light, and it's not good. So is he the guy that falls late first, second maybe? And second it's not round? helping him that he's at a non-premium position to where. Whoa, whoa. Okay, you're gonna linebacker. Three down linebacker. Linebacker is a premium position. I would take him number two overall. Okay. I would take I mean, Ruben yeah, Foster number two overall. Yeah. Linebacker is a premium position if you're good. You're that good, yeah. If you're at, uh, if you're good in all three downs, I would take Luke Kuechly, top five. Yeah, I would take I mean, Patrick Willis, top Kuechly five. Mm-hmm. And I think Foster has a chance to be in that range. But he is free falling. Another guy that we're seeing in a lot of mocks, a lot of stuff, just not going to where we had thought pre-draft or where we even have him evaluated. And that's Corey Davis, the Western Michigan receiver, because basically he didn't have a pre-draft process. When you don't run a 40 time, when you don't work out for NFL teams, and when there were so much, sort of questions about his you know, high-level athleticism to begin with, yeah, I feel like you're just going to get passed on at that point, especially when John Ross runs a 40 in record-breaking time and Mike Williams – Runs a good enough 40 for his size to where if you're debating between the two, one's ran the 40, one hasn't, one's worked out, that you can tell is still athletic. Just, but just watch Corey Davis on film. Watch him on film. He's the best I receiver. To... Separates better than anybody else in the class, except maybe John Ross. John Ross can create mm-hmm. some pretty crazy separation in part because of that deep speed. But I'll talk about Corey Davis a little bit later when I got some bold predictions coming out. Corey Davis... Okay. We keep putting, here's where I, where I am on him, we keep putting him in the top 10, I keep putting him in the top 10 in these mock drafts, he's one of those guys that's going to go to a pretty good team now, It possibly could go to a really good team, mm-hmm. and be just an outstanding fit, because he's going to potentially drop in the first round, just because he didn't work out, I saw him on tape, I think he'll be fine. Yeah, if you have questions of a guy's speed, if you can't define their speed on tape, whether it's on a go route whether it's seeing them run 20 yards unabated with the ball in their hands after the catch. Those plays happen. Just get out your stopwatch. Go back to time that. which My, podcast? Was this 8.0, 7.0? It was the post-combine when I had the eliminate the combine take. Go go record some numbers. Mike's off hottest play. take was eliminate the combine. Just stop watching yourself on tape. Yes. And you can do that with Corey Davis. And I don't need to see him running track that. shorts. Exactly. And, Upsetting, but he's free for right now. We're firing up. He something. could end up at the back half of the first round, back end of the first round. And last guy that we've sort of seen a free fall from in this draft process, Jonathan Allen. Once thought of as a top three, top five guy, Daniel Jeremiah's last mock has him going 17th, late teens for a guy with really the only question mark being subpar athleticism. Not terrible athleticism, but below uh, average for the position. The arthritic shoulders. And the shoulders, sorry. Come up as well. Um, the, here's, here's, I think where we are with some of the combine measurements. I think it's all about the context, right? So I, I make the excuse for Dalvin Cook. I don't care about the combine because when I watch the film, he's the fastest player on the field every time he's out there. At least he plays like it. Mm-hmm. With Jonathan Allen, the way he wins with technique, with strength, with power, sheds blocks. He's not a, he's not a guy that shoots gaps anyway. So I'm not as worried about the technique because of the way... He gets the job done on the field. Now, other guys, I think you go back to the film and you say, okay, the combine doesn't match with what I've seen. Allen's a guy I'm more willing to ignore. I still think he's a top five player. His production, not just last year, when I think he was a Heisman finalist or contender, Mm -hmm. previous years, rushing the passer, his production was off the charts. I'm still a believer in Jonathan Allen. Yeah, those question marks don't really move the needle for me. I'm still right up there as a top five talent in this class. I take him before Solomon Thomas, in my opinion. I think he's that good, even with the athleticism discrepancy between the two. I'd rather have Allen. That's just me. On to now some bold predictions. Sam and I did bold predictions Monday. Steve missed out. He wants in on it. He's got five bold predictions himself. Let's hear him. All right. Did that, I think I may have stolen one of yours. Go ahead. The three QBs in the top 13. Oh, Steve, just go back. listen to our podcast, Steve. Come on. Well, what if yeah. I just agree with you? Okay, yeah, that's fine. It's yeah. not that bold. Maybe I guess it's not bold if you're agreeing with me about that. So, Watson, Trubisky, Mahomes, top 13. I got six because you didn't want to count that one. George Kittle will be the number two overall tight end in this draft. All around tight end. So, when, you, when you're on PFF three or four years from now, and you're looking at just overall package of his overall grade, his run block grade, 
his receiving grade, it's going to be George Kittle. Evan Ingram, Gerald Everett, they might have better receiving grades. They're ranked higher in our rankings. Kittle's going to be the number two overall tight end behind O.J. Howard. Way to suck up, Steve. Little programming note. We're going to have George Kittle on the podcast <laughs> a little bit later on. He had a nice interview with our guy Sam, so tune in. Good work, George. Number three, Jordan Brown knows Willis will lead the class, will lead this draft class in sacks. Oh, my. In multiple years okay. in the future. So multiple years, Jordan Willis will be the sack leader over Miles Garrett, Derek Barnett, and all these other guys, these other top edge rushers, Carl Lawson That's and bold. all of them. Now you went bold. He has two years in his career where Jordan Willis leads in sacks. Kansas State defensive end. Um, somewhat bold. I'm going to say only three offensive linemen go in the first round. Okay. Uh, I, think, I think the league gets smart on Cam Robinson, and they don't put him in the first. I would love to see what that. What about that? But... Well, that remains to be seen. So Forrest Lamp, Garrett Bowles. I would love to see that because you did right on Cam Robinson as being the first tackle off the board a handful of weeks ago. Oh, shoot. Now I'm 50 bucks myself. On it. I yeah. forgot about that. <laughs> that. It's all right. No, it's fine. Things have changed. Winds have changed. Yeah. That's what happens during draft season. Draft stock season. Bye and so on. Obi Melifonwu. Okay. What about him? Top three cornerback oh, in this class. class. Mm. Obi Melifon, with a 6'4", 224-pound safety from UConn. I know some teams are looking at him at corner. The right team drafts him, puts him at corner. Potential top three cornerback in this class. I like it because if he does go and play corner for someone, it's going to be in a scheme that's very suited towards his skill set. Yeah, where... and we saw him at the Senior Bowl. He's playing yeah. press man. I mean, 6'4", so he's Brandon Browner with athleticism. Yeah. On, on the edge there. He might not be as physical as Browner, who likes to kill people, but Obi may be a top three corner in this class. I'm hedging my bet a little bit. But okay. next one, back to Corey Davis, Western Michigan. Of course, it's going to be the right f- scheme and the fit and all that fun stuff, but we're going to say Corey Davis is going to be top ten all time in receptions Whoa. at the end of his career. Oh. Top ten all time. So you guys are going to have to check bold. back in about 15 years. <laughs> yeah. Uh, be listening to the PFF Pro podcast make for the a, next 15 years. I was going to say, make a uh, Google Calendar reminder. 15 yes. years from now. Uh, like, Steve, <laughs> uh, Corey Davis just retired. He's only 12. You were wrong. Yeah. So be sure to check in on that. Corey Davis is a high-volume receiver who can get open against man, knows how to get open against zone, great feel, can win down the field in contested situations, can create yards after the catch. So he's going to catch a lot of passes in the screen game at the intermediate level. At the deep level. Corey Davis, top 10 all-time in receptions. I'll see you in 15 years. Those anyway. were bolder than my picks. Definitely. That's what you told me to do. Yeah, they were bold. I'm, I'm impressed. I like it. Definitely bold. I don't and know if I really believe all of them, but we're here. We're here for the people, the entertainment. By the way, can we just brag a little bit about the PFF Pro Podcast? What about it? Oh, wait, go ahead. Just setting records. We are setting records. We just everybody. want to thank everybody. We appreciate everybody that has joined in mm-hmm. and everybody that's made us... Made this the best month in the history of the PFF Did over, Pro yeah, Podcast. Most downloads in a month by far. And Almost double. Still more room to go here in April. And we just encourage you guys to stick with us after the draft. I know there's a big push during the draft. Stick with us after the draft. We've got more content. We're going to have a lot more content. A lot of cool stuff. Roll right into next season. But we just appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. And we're going to start doing some interviews on the draft. Most, or Excuse me. Just of people in general post-draft. And we're going to start out with one right now. George Kittle, the Iowa tight end, as Steve alluded to earlier, the second best in this class, apparently, according to him. Overall, all around uh, tight end. And Sam will be interviewing him. Hope you enjoy it. Take it away, Sam. Thanks, George, for uh, joining us on the Pro Football Focus podcast. So the first question I have for you is an easy one. Um, you were listed at 235 pounds as a senior at Iowa. You weighed in at 247 at the Combine. What kind of workout program did you get on, man? I mean, I played my senior season at 252, so I think that just never got updated. <laughs> that makes more sense. That makes a lot more sense. Because otherwise, we're going to have yeah, to start no. marketing your workout program or your diet or something. I mean, I, my, uh, my registered sophomore year, I was 225, and then my junior year, I was 240, and then my senior year, I was 252. Wow. Um, so yeah. one of the... One of the things that we love about you, you, um, we have 
the guy that looked at your tape um, for Pro Football Focus Scouting, this guy called Josh Liskowitz, you probably know that because I'm sure at this point you've had to take out a restraining order on the man because he absolutely <laughs> loves your tape. He wrote an article heading into your last season claiming you were the, be- the, most, the best all-round tight end in the entire nation. Um, so we've, we've been on the, the George Kittle bandwagon for a while. Um, but the thing that we love about your play is – your, your run blocking, because blocking for tight ends these days is, it's like optional most places. You know, these guys are looking for the ball. They're looking to make plays through the air, and run blocking just kind of gets left by the wayside. But you've been crushing guys in the run game. Yeah, I mean, um, at Iowa, you don't, you don't play if you can't run block a tight end. And that's one thing that I learned early on. And um, you know, at Iowa, we use our tight ends in, like, every single run play, like, two tight ends, three tight ends, um, and we're usually at the point of attack for those runs, and so um, it's something we have to do really well at, and over the course of the year, that took a lot of pride in it, because uh, it's just something I really enjoy. I mean, it's one of the best things in football is moving a man from point A to point B against his will, and it's just something that is always stuck with me. So, yeah, I just take a lot of pride in it. That's what I was going to ask you, if you enjoyed it, because I threw on some of your tape earlier today, and I was watching you against uh, North Dakota State, and you were routinely victimizing some poor little defensive back who was getting like driven 15 yards away from the point of attack, and you were just mauling him. It was incredible. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what they tell me to do. Like Your job is to take this guy and get him out of the play, and so... Um, you know, I'm going to take that upon myself to uh, make him pay for being in my way. Um, but, of course, like I said, you were, you're an all-round kind of guy. You may not have had the, the volume of passes thrown your way, but you had the seventh best um, figure in terms of yards per route run over the last couple of years. So you were productive in the passes that did come your way. Are you expecting, once you make it to the NFL, that that's going to be an increased role? You're going to be a guy that gets you know, far more passes thrown his way? I mean, I hope so. I mean, really my goal is just if you give me an opportunity on the field and you tell me what you want me to do, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability, whether that's run blocking or running routes and catching the rock. Uh, I don't really, I could care less. As long as I'm on the field, I'm happy. Good attitude. Um, So what's this pre-draft process been like for you? It's been really fun, actually. I had the opportunity to go down to uh, Frisco, Texas, which is just north of Dallas. Uh, right after the bowl game, I was there like the second week of January, and I was training at an Exos facility. Um, and I was there with guys like Ryan Switzer, Trent Taylor, um, Avante Collins, um, Malachi Dupree. You know, we had a good group of guys. It was a nice small group, too. So I really enjoyed my time there. They helped me out preparing for the combine a lot. Um, and, you know, just being able to talk about, you know, guys' different programs, you know, how they ran things, just how their facilities were different. It was, that was really fun for me. And then, after the combine, I mean, first off, I loved the combine. I had so much fun there just being able to talk to coaches about football, you know, because I hadn't been talking football for about two months. That was really a good time for me, and then being able to test well was really fun. Um, and then I've been back in Iowa since, training at Iowa. Um, and I've, you know, just enjoyed being back in uh, Iowa City with my family. So, you know, I've had a great pre-draft experience, and I just can't wait to be back on a football field in two weeks. And as soon as you're done with the combine, do you switch back into kind of training – to play football as opposed to training for the combine, training for those measurables? Well, a little bit of both because we had like one of the latest pro days. I think it was like March 27th. And so I had uh, cause I didn't run the pro agility or the three cone at um, the combine because I, was, I didn't really practice it down in Texas because I was rehabbing a, a lingering foot injury from the season. So I, didn't, um, so I ran those at pro day, so I had to train for those. But yeah, it was nice getting back into the football lifting, strength building stuff, and, you know, it's something that I really enjoy doing. Um, and what kind of feedback have you been getting from NFL teams when you talk to them? Like, how do, what, kind of, what kind of stuff do they, do they give you as opposed to just looking for information and looking to see, you know, what you're gonna, how you're going to react to certain questions and all that kind of stuff? What do you get out of that, those talks? You know, just being able to talk. I've talked to almost all 32 teams. You know, every interview is a little bit different. I had the opportunity, I was in San Francisco last week, and I really enjoyed my time there, just being able to talk to coaches, you know, just about football and stuff. But, you know, I take, I know, I think they all are just pleased with my uh, my blocking on film, and I think they also think I'm a 
I'm an okay receiver, you know, that, you know, hopefully I can run more routes in the NFL, but I think they're all just pleased with my work ethic and um, how much I love football. So what are your plans for the draft? How are you going to, how are you going to set up and watch the, the big event and how are you going to deal with all that? Uh, I will be at home with my parents and um, some friends, but nothing big, you know, I just, you know, small group of people just being able to watch it and, you know, enjoy myself during the time. I'm going to try not to be stressed out about it, you know, just let it happen. And, you know, I can't control anything. I put my film out there. I put my testing numbers out there. So just waiting on a team to, you know, like me enough to pick me up. And, you know, the the kind of the off-season program and, and um, OTAs and training camp and all that kind of stuff, that's what veteran guys in the NFL, they loathe that. They hate that. But you must be itching just to get out there and show the NFL that you can play at this level, right? Yeah, I'm really, I, I just, you know, I've been on a football field, you know, playing a game since January, well, I think January 2nd. So yeah, I'm, I'm itching just to get back on the field and, you know, just be given the opportunity to play football again. And I just can't wait to, you know, prove what I can do and uh, show the guys that I belong. All right. Sounds good, man. Well, we wish you all the best. Thanks for making some time to, to talk to us on the, the PFF podcast and hope you get taken as, as, as high as you can. Hey, thank you so much for having me on. It was a pleasure. Thank you, George, for that amazing interview. Uh, good stuff there from the Iowa tight end. We'll, we'll hope he gets going uh, second round somewhere, somewhere that'll use him. We have him ranked pretty high. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, we have him uh, right in there in that mix of after of he's, tight ends after the first round. He's a very good complementary tight end, uh, very good blocking on the move, shifty in and out of routes, uh, did not get a ton of opportunities in the past game at Iowa, but every time he did... Speed he to test the seam. That's my take on tight ends. You, I don't want a tight end that runs lower than a 4 you hate seven. My guy, Michael Roberts, who ran the 4 eight. Yeah, I mean... But I think Michael Roberts is a great red zone threat. Big fan of him as well. Deep tight end class. Mike. Let's keep it moving, though. On to just some picks and some fits that we keep hearing about, that we've heard whispers about, whether it's via uh, multiple people's mock drafts, whether it's via teams that we work with, whether it's just they give away their secrets, yeah, but, you know, but, uh, here are some things. Whether it's uh, you know, NFL insiders, that sort of thing. Just some picks that we keep going back to just to round them up and give our take on them. And one is that we keep hearing right now that the Browns are looking to trade up from 12, if they don't go uh, quarterback at number one, which fingers crossed, hopefully they don't. Hopefully they don't. You know, hopefully take Miles Garrett. Garrett and they take Miles Garrett. But after that, they're looking to get back up from 12 and still get their guy. Mitch Trubisky is apparently the target. What do you think of that? You think you think that's the right way to go about this? Yeah, I've been saying for a few weeks now. Take Miles Garrett, then play the draft. Play the draft, meaning you're at 12, you have all this draft capital, then go figure out the quarterback situation. Do not take Trubisky and take a chance at losing Miles Garrett. Then they have to figure out, you know, the 49ers at 2 probably can be patient. Maybe they're not going to take Trubisky. The Bears at 3 looked at this draft class and then signed Mike Glennon. And granted, they're not locked into Glennon long term. They could still draft a quarterback, but they still looked at the class and then signed him. Maybe they're out. The Jaguars to, might be out. To be fair, though, and I think I mentioned this the other day, they looked at the class, even if there were two stud quarterbacks in this class, both teams in front of them need a quarterback. So it, it's not like I they were it. locked into getting a quarterback if there was a good one in this class. So. so Cleveland has to figure out, do you need to get up to three over the Bears? Do you need to get up to five over the Jets? Do you need to get mm-hmm. up over the Bills at ten? But play the draft, use your draft capital, go get Trubisky, if that's your thing, but don't do it at one. Definitely don't do it at one. Yeah, I can get on board with trading back up because I don't think you can leave this draft without a quarterback. Right. And if four, like we said in our bold predictions, if four are going to go in the first round, just not really developmental guys then left. See, so, yeah, know, there's not. I, I disagree, actually. I think you can leave this draft without a quarterback. If you're the Browns, it's the second year of your regime. Mm-hmm. And I know the fans have been waiting for 20 years for a quarterback. I get it. I'm still saying exhibit patience. If you can spend, they had 14 picks last year. We were talking to Burt Breer, our uh, partner on the yeah. SI show, Thursday night, last night. He was saying this is a, a legendary draft class as far as draft capital goes mm-hmm. for the Browns. What if they use all that draft capital to just build the roster? Load up on the defense. What if they come away with Miles Garrett and Jonathan Allen mm-hmm. at 12? Miles Garrett and Corey Davis, who's going to be a top t- 10 all-time receiver. 
What if they come away with Miles Garrett and Reuben Foster? Elite talent in the first, the second, the third round. Load up that roster. And I'm not saying next year's draft class is going to be way better at quarterback like everybody seems to think. But continue to build the roster. Show patience at quarterback. Figure out the right guy. Man, the Browns could be good. They could. But then, here's the thing. When do you get the quarterback? Is Whenever still... it's right. When the time is right. He'll be there. You say that. Mike, you're I, a I single guess. guy. Uh, <laughs> you might be dating someone right now. I don't know if you're going to get married or not. But it's not going there. Don't force it, man. <laughs> you can't force it. Uh, it's just, though, that all of a sudden, if you get better this year, you're drafting seventh than next year instead of first. You're all of a sudden, you, then I get that they have draft capital again next year to maybe go for that first overall pick. But I just think you would like some guy in tow to develop at some point. I get it. Well, I'm look, not, and I'm not saying it's, they get, that if, they have to go get him at first round. But if someone at the top of the second would be nice, I don't know. I would, say, well, I would still say keep drafting quarterbacks, too. Yeah. You know, if, even, if, even if it is a Davis Webb who we don't necessarily believe in. I'm all for Cody Kessler's on the roster. Nathan Peterman's on the roster, even if they're the same type of guy. Mm-hmm. Davis Webb's on the roster. Keep drafting quarterbacks. I'm fine with that. But I'm also fascinated by Cleveland building an unbelievable defense I do. in this draft. Which they could do. They could get three starters in the secondary in the first two rounds and Miles Garrett. Yeah. Like they did in one of my mock drafts. That would be awesome. Would be. All right. That's. I can get on board with that for the Browns. On to the next one we're hearing, and it's the Jaguars at number four. Leonard Fournette and Deshaun Watson possibilities there. Hearing both those names linked. I mean, I don't want to talk about Fournette anymore because I've already gone in on him more than enough. And I'm probably going to do it again Thursday night when he gets drafted by, <laughs> by someone in the top four. ten. But the Deshaun Watson is interesting to me. Yeah, I, have to I, say. I did that a couple mock drafts ago. If, they're actually, if they actually are looking at him, that one is intriguing. I like the fit there. The thing we keep saying about the Jaguars, right? They've loaded up in, on the, in the defensive secondary. They don't need Marshawn Lattimore, Mike. We've been pushing for Marshawn Lattimore. They need Marshawn Lattimore. Like, okay. All right, and we'll talk about that. Put that aside for a second. Having three three really good corners, that's that's just bad for your team, apparently, according to the no, Twitter. No, I mean, no one's ever been – there's no good defense that has three great corners. Sarcasm meter is high. So, look, they've, they've invested a lot in the secondary. They've invested a lot in the defensive line. The entire defense, really. They've got good wide receivers. They're weak at what? Offensive line. Could, do, could use a running back like a Fournette, could use a tight end. So everybody keeps saying, ah, give him O.J. Howard. Hey, give him Leonard Fournette. They've been linked to Fournette in general. But what about the quarterback? We were talking about Cleveland building that really good roster and then figuring out the QB. I feel like Jacksonville might be there. They've built this roster that has a lot of good players. But you're worried about Blake Bortles, who just went from a good year two to a terrible year three. Why are you locked into him long term? You have a fifth-year option coming up at the end of this year. So you're only really linked to him for one, maybe two more years. Quarterback might be way more in play than people let on initially. And that's why I did I gave them Watson in a mock recently. Bring in competition for Blake Bortles. And the one thing I like about Watson, the fit there, is his propensity to give his wide receivers chances on, you know, in tight coverage, down the field, where it's 50-50 balls, but he's putting it in a good spot where only his guy's going to get it. That's what Allen Robin. That's what Allen Robinson needs. He needs a guy who's going to give you know him an actual chance to bring in those balls down the field. Whereas Blake Bortles last year was all over the place in terms of ball placement on those throws. Point. Really, it was a big part of the aggression of Allen Robinson was mainly on Blake Bortles. I know Robinson had his fair share of drops, but the ball placement on those throws was night and day from 2015 to 2016. Watson can make those throws. That's one of the best parts of his game to me. Uh, the rest of the questions with Deshaun Watson, the decision-making, all that other stuff, I mean, those are the same questions we have with Blake Bortles going into this season. So why not put some competition there, see which you know cream rises to the top, and get yourself in a position where quarterback's not going to be a liability, or at least a chance that quarterback not be a liability. Send a warning shot to Blake Bortles saying that's not going to be okay. This I, I love it, and people are afraid of competition at the quarterback mm-hmm. spot. It might be the case where you drafted Deshaun Watson and maybe you get the best out of Blake Bortles. And I know that, hey, I'm using my number four pick on a backup quarterback, but maybe you get something. Maybe you get a great say, year out of Blake Bortles. And also, with the way trade's going with quarterback position, if the Bengals are asking for a number one for AJ McCarron, 
Deshaun Watson plays one good game. That's all you got to do. Bench, so all this is sudden, the strategy, You're right? flipping him for two number ones, you know, in three years down the road. If Blake Bortles does come good and is your starter of the future, all of a sudden you can dish Deshaun Watson for, you know, uh, roster. <laughs> all right. Jaguars, if you're listening, here's the plan. We're going to draft Deshaun Watson. You light a fire under Blake, who's very talented. Mm -hmm. Blake comes out, has an outstanding year four here. But what you have to do is you have to play Watson for one game. Yes. you got to pick your spots, though. The worst defense 17. that you play, yeah. put Watson out there. Uh, all you really need now, all you really need is like five to fifteen passes. Yes, and then you're a future. Then you're going to command a first round pick. Mm -hmm. uh, AJ McCarron has played about two and a half games, and all of a sudden he goes from a fifth rounder to commanding a first rounder. As we're asking for a first rounder, so strategically put Watson out there, flip him for another first. It's I don't see how that could go wrong. Like that, other than actually, you spent fourth overall for. But Boston. actually, I don't see how it could go wrong because that seems to be a a very reasonable strategy with how much people are willing to pay for the quarterback position. And Maybe that's, that's why you keep drafting quarterbacks. You keep drafting quarterbacks, let them play a little bit in the right situation, and keep flipping them for. I've crazy said and, until I know I have a guy, I'm going to keep drafting guys at quarterback position until I know I have a good one. I keep doing it in the first round because of how valuable they are. So you and I actually sat down and talked to a team employee uh, during the offseason here at one point, and he kind of played mm -hmm. through that scenario. What if you had a bunch of first and second round picks and you used every single one on a quarterback, and how would that play out if you truly just need to find one? Really just keep drafting, and it's all, and that would be the equivalent of trading your entire draft yes. to go get one, right? Was, so if you, if you were to mortgage your future and give up four picks for one, for one quarterback, what if in, instead you use those four picks to just draft four quarterbacks? That's the equivalent. Oh, he said the yeah the the haul that you would need to get out of that the quarterback you know sort of level you would need to use all your picks. How one quarterback is Andy Dalton was what is that what he said? He said that's the sort of le if to to get a return on your investment worthy of dra drafting taking all your draft picks and using them on quarterbacks is just Andy Dalton, which is I mean I think you if you did like I said if you did that. Every year for the past three years, you would have gotten someone like Dak Prescott or Derek Carr. You would have gotten... You would have stumbled into someone. Yeah, you would have stumbled into one. So, I, I'm, When we're running a team, Mike, we will play... All QB draft. We will play with this uh, scenario, strategy. All right. all right, we'll keep moving here through the draft to some other names linked to teams. Christian McCaffrey now to the Panthers. It's a done deal, it seems like. Everyone has that. There's... Supposedly, teams giving McCaffrey guarantees, and from all the mocks, it looks like the Panthers might be one of them. So, I'm going to go back to Leonard Fournette for a minute here because we trashed Fournette everywhere. We have this is one of those teams we have McCaffrey ranked higher than Fournette, mm -hmm. but I would rather see Fournette in the Panthers scheme. Unless I it's a complete overall. Disagree. No, I would rather see Fournette. They run power. It's the perfect That's scheme for him downhill. Stanford. I'm not saying I'm okay. not saying McCaffrey can't. Run power. Mm -hmm. I'm saying if I have a power scheme, I like Fournette better. The Panthers are also for 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 McCaffrey to succeed. I'm looking at a team that has a high volume passing attack that I know is going to move him around, feed him the ball. He is a smaller receiver. Cam Newton needs his big targets. We have an inaccurate quarterback thrown to a small target. I don't think it's going to be a high volume passing attack. Mm -hmm. Fournette's a better fit. They're a run first team, running power. You have huge Cam Newton. You have huge Leonard Fournette in the backfield. Who wants to stop that? That's your play, Panthers. I wholeheartedly disagree. One, you have Jonathan Stewart already. He's not. He's, he's on the decline. Six. He's on the decline. He's old. Thirty, but not that far on the decline that I'm going to completely give up on him. He has Let a me couple just throw my, years left. Can I just throw my axiom in there? Okay, yeah. Go ahead. Player X, who's currently on the team, gonna, in this case, Jonathan Stewart, is not going to keep me from drafting a but younger, better player. That's what I'm saying. Player. You can ease McCaffrey in. In terms of you don't need to give him all the carries. You don't need to get him hurt, which is some of the, one of the concern with his size, that he'll get hurt. But the underrated aspect of McCaffrey going there, Mike Shula, Carolina Panthers offense coordinator, one of the most underrated play callers and or creative minds on the offense side of the ball in the NFL today. They do a lot of different stuff there to take advantage of the offensive personnel. And if you give him a weapon like Christian McCaffrey, that will be a position where he gets taken advantage of. They won't underutilize him in that offense. He will be featured. They will be doing things that fit his skill set. And when you're in an offense, when like we've said throughout this whole draft process, 
that's what McCaffrey needs, and then he's worthy of that you know X high pick, however you want to go. Which some of our draft analysts have gone all the way up to number two with him, which I don't is a little crazy. But Maybe number eight much. wouldn't be that crazy to me because of all the things he can do in that regard. So great out of the backfield, even, so great in space, so great in the slot. Even if they I use him, even if they use him in creative fashion, again, I just don't know that that fits with Cam Newton style as a passer in the yeah. pass game. I want McCaffrey. I mean, McCaffrey could be a, a very good slot receiver in this league. That's how I want him used as well as a running back. So, look, I'm not saying McCaffrey won't have success there. I just think Fournette might be a better fit. That's all. Okay. That's all I'm saying. Stop disagreeing with me. On to the 11th pick, where the Saints all of a sudden are getting linked to Bama cornerback Marlon Humphrey, skyrocketing up some boards. It's an Eli Apple move right here. I'm a fan of Marlon Humphrey's game. All right, defend Marlon Humphrey to me. So, everyone likes to talk about how he gave a bunch of big plays. He did. Penalties. And they blame his ball skills, lack of ball skills for 16. that. Sixteen point nine yards per reception in the last two seasons. That's way too high. Very high. But here's the thing: because he's not giving up short passes, like he's very good in the underneath stuff. And I'm not so sure that he has bad ball skills. I think he just got burned by a handful of amazing catches. He's at the catch point, hitting guys' hands, hitting guys' arms, and we just saw a number of guys just make ridiculous circus catches on him that. I mean, it's going to happen with only a sample size of about 15 to 20 targets down the field over the last you know year. Sometimes, you know, five either way is going to really skew your stats. So you don't think his ball skills at the catch point are a concern? He's not. Com- he's not. OK, he's not good there. He's never. I don't think he's ever going to be this amazing you know player of the football at the catch point. But it's not so bad to where he's lost, like overrunning receivers. He's still has his hand there, still in the right spot, is just getting beat more than you like. But it's not so worrisome to me. So, like you said, Eli Apple, very comparable in terms of that as well. He didn't have that great ball skills in college at Ohio State. I like I like Marlon Humphrey before the catch. I like him in zone. He really closes on the ball extremely well. Our guy Gordon even said he'd be a really good safety. I wouldn't put him at safety, but I could see him having – he'd have safety skills. I could see that, even though we're – Talking about catch point stuff. So I think he played a lot of schemes. He's six foot plus. He could be a press man corner. Was tested really well at the combine. Yeah. There's a lot to like about Humphrey. I'm still concerned about the big plays. I think that's a factor. I don't hate him at 11. He's the classic player right now. I'm saying all that list of players that you gave me, uh-huh. guys that are dropping. Humphrey's the type of guy that's just sitting gonna there. Benefit from it. Clean slate. He's going to benefit from it and just end up top 10, top 50. My thing though with this pick and why I don't. Really love it is because Saints have a number of other needs besides corner, and there will still be corners at 32 worthy of getting selected, I, is my right. thought. The difference between Marlon Humphrey at 11 and the corner that will be there at 32 is not as great as someone like maybe Derek Barnett at 11 and the defensive end that will be there at 32. That's not even that great of an example because uh, that's not really true. But... Uh, <laughs> Maybe someone like Ruben Either Foster, edge. but it, well, Ruben Ball. Ruben say, Foster. All the guys seem to be fall- they're they're someone like Jonathan Allen. The Allen. Saints have had some of the worst linebacker play, not only yes. in the NFL but in just recent NFL history the last few years. So adding a Ruben Foster and then adding a corner mm-hmm. or edge would be an outstanding haul. And so there's a couple different ways that they can go. I don't hate the pick, but definitely think Humphrey would be better on the turn, yeah. close to 32. And actually, okay, on to the next one, which I actually skipped, which we're hearing, and it's Hassan Reddick being linked to the Cincinnati Bengals at number nine overall. So this is more about a couple mock drafts. Peter King mm-hmm. and Peter Schrager mm-hmm. from Good Morning Football mm-hmm. did a little did a little ditty with uh, Lance Zerline as well. GMFB the other day. Lance Zerline had him too. So a lot of people put in Reddick to the Bengals. I kept saying the Bengals' best fits were Corey Davis. Wide receiver, mm-hmm. Derek Barnett, defensive end. I thought that those were their best case scenario. If it's Reddick, does he play some off the ball linebacker? Does he fill some of that pass rushing, that edge rushing void on third down? I think there's some versatility there that they could use. I'm kind of torn on Reddick because I understand all of the versatility and being able to do all these other things, but I also think it's a class of really good edge rushers, really good corners, and a couple of good linebackers who maybe do their specific tasks. Better than Reddick does all of these tasks. You're pointing at me like, 
Yep. Yes, that's it. This, to me, Hassan Reddick moving up draft boards this highly reminds me a lot of Deion Jordan going top three a few years back to the Dolphins when it's, oh, Deion Jordan, oh, look at him, he can rush the passer. Look at him, he can drop into coverage. Look at him, he's this freakishly athletic 6'6 six, six oh, linebacker I, 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 hybrid that can do it all. I have a take on that. But there were guys who could rush the passer better than him in that class. There were guys who could cover than him better than that class. And you really would rather have a guy who's can do one of those aspects at a very high level than both at an adequate level. And that, to me, seems like the sound Reddick at this point. He's going to be able it. to do everything, right. but he's not going to be a ma- master of any. I like him a little bit later in the first. Mid-first, maybe. Mm-hmm. Maybe a little bit later. The, the Deion Jordan thing, I feel like a big part of his hype was just the fact that he was six foot seven. Yeah. So nobody had ever seen a six foot seven player covered the way he did, which was cool. It was like this novelty <laughs> Super, thing. Yeah. But it doesn't but like him covering well at six foot seven is not more valuable than a guy covering at six foot four. Yeah. And I think that'll work, man. other than the rest yeah. of Jordan's <laughs> off field issues and his weight issues and all that other stuff, I feel like that's he was a little overrated because hey, look at the six foot seven guy in coverage. Didn't mean he was great yeah. in coverage. All right, so Reddick, I mean, I'd rather have Ruben Foster there from the Bengals. Obviously, whatever, but... Ruben Foster, too, yeah. Ruben Foster's just going to be better. Ruben Foster's going to be a better linebacker than Reddick. This it's is like why I'm that, saying the theme, though, right? Reddick's clean thinks. off the field. Yeah. So He's all these another guys, guy pushed up because... All these guys that we think are going to be excellent football players are getting pushed down and clean guys like Marlon Humphrey, Hassan Reddick, moving up draft boards. Let that be a lesson to our listeners. If you're don't, an NFL draft prospect. Don't test positive at the combine. Going to hibernation. <laughs> don't be, as I said yesterday, hydrate. Just don't go to the combine. Yet. But don't <laughs> don't hydrate too much, though. Yeah. If you hydrate too much, you have a diluted sample. Championship level. So you got to be hydrated, but not too hydrated. Good advice. The words to live by. All right, on to another one. The Cardinals and Patrick Mahomes. A match made in heaven. I would love to see Mahomes with Bruce Arians. Yeah. Downfield passing attack. Learn behind Carson Palmer for say, the a way year. He made Carson Palmer into a good quarterback, actually, at one point. Unbelievable how that happened. That's like the Chip Kelly turned Nick Foles into yeah. the top passer rating guy. Yeah, and you think about what Mahomes does best, and it's just make throws down the field that other people cannot make. That's the Arizona Cardinals offense. All right, make this happen, Cardinals. Go get Patrick Mahomes. This unless, one makes too much sense. Unless the Browns steal him. That's a match made that we like to see. Yeah, just no real qualms there. Just make it happen. That Jordan Clocker, you've been all over this one for a while. Next one that we're seeing is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers linked to Dalvin Cook. And I just I don't get the Buccaneers to a running back thing. Like Doug Martin, I do. I've done Doug, Martin's, the, Doug Martin's due for his upswing, I feel like. You know, he goes oh, you're, that, playing, you're playing the odds. The, the, down, the roller coasters down on the way back up your... This is the one year he stays healthy for about 12 games and goes for 1,500 yards. My other draft axiom, Mike, I'm going to tweet these out. My other draft draft, draft axiom number four. You're not drafting for this year. You're not that drafting just for this year. That's, that gets lost a lot, I feel like. People, I even get lost in that sometimes. Be like, oh, they don't need this because they have a 33-year-old safety. They right, the 33 year olds not only is like the good player not going to keep you from yeah. drafting this other good player... But the 33-year-old good player is not going to keep you from drafting a good player. Dalvin Cook's a good fit. I think any of the running backs are a good fit. I don't think they have to force a running back in the first round. That's like my thing. Kareem Hunt in the second round for them would uh-huh. be a really nice fit. If they, But they still have a lot that they can do on the defensive side of the ball. Maybe tap into this edge rusher class. Add more corners and safeties to the mix. Just keep... Yeah, if they get just it. Keep loading up I mean, like, they got Charles Sims, too, who was the third rounder in 2014. They've used a lot of draft capital on running backs. Just... Let Charles Sims play. I don't know. Yeah, but Dalvin and Jameis played together. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Now, Sold. now I want him. Uh, <laughs> Sold. I, I do love Dalvin, though. So if they did go that route. Did we? I'm we didn't gonna... put Dalvin in this list of fallers earlier. Oh, did we not? I he mean, he's just be, an obvious, I thought. But that's another one. I, he's a first round player. I think he's the best running back in the draft, personally. But I can get on board with that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, La- one of the last ones we're seeing that I'm actually intrigued by happening is the Steelers going tight end somewhere in the first round and, and with their first pick, whether it be Njoku, whether it be Evan Ingram, whether it be someone else. Yeah. I'm intrigued because 
I'm always of the belief that any need on your roster, you don't have to. So the Steelers are worse on the defensive side than the offensive side. But if you have a need on the offensive side, I think any need still improves you by you know X amount over. You don't have to address the weaker side of the ball. Make one side dominant, and you can forget about the other side. It's my thing. Get a dominant offense. Get a dominant receiving core, and yeah, I, I, I'll stop worrying about my defense being as bad. I think the Steelers have been set up for that for a while now. Mm-hmm. When they had Martavis Bryant, who was just dominant at, at points when he was on the field, Antonio Brown being one of the best wide receivers, mm-hmm. Roethlisberger getting it, getting them the ball, and 2014 and 15 probably being his two best seasons as a quarterback. Mm-hmm. I'm all for the Steelers winning strictly on offense and loading up on playmakers and making it so tough yes. on the opposition. So I don't hate it. But it's also a deep tight end class. I'd still rather them look at edge rusher and corner because I think the I think the value matches up better for their draft to go you know, edge or corner first round. Gerald Everett could be there in the second round. Our guy, late second round. That is our boy. Even though we think he's a second round player. Um, and again, another draft axiom: draft players, not positions. So, but all I'm saying is, I think the way the board's well, going to fall, edge or corner, would be good value for the Steelers. My draft axiom: just don't draft running backs or tight ends in the first round. We have to tweet out our draft action. We have to draft. We have to tweet these out. Uh, I'm gonna. Hey. I'm gonna get this out, out to the Twitter people. That's it's, it's important. Yeah, I I agree. Uh, I've said a lot of them over the eleven point one podcast that we've done, and accumulate your thoughts. To be honest, I can't remember all of them, but uh, yeah, that'd, that'd be good to organize this at some point. That is it for us, though. What about draft pass? Make draft sure pass. to check out draft pass. One day left before the draft. Did you have the promo code? Did you give up the promo code? I gave code the promo the code day? without you. It was PFF Steve is the promo code. No caps, no five dollars off. So you get five dollars off the draft pass. Don't forget, draft pass includes a PDF, which I did download. I mean, I did print out, print out. and got it bound. It was pretty awesome. So you get the PDF. You get the online component. Two hundred fifty plus scouting reports grades or stats on over a thousand guys. It's pretty awesome. Check it out. ProFootballFocus.com backslash DraftPass17. And for our millions and millions of listeners, you get the promo code PFFSteve. Five dollars off. Pretty uh, narcissistic there to make it your name is the promo code. The marketing department. We get it. Okay. We can give marketing you one. Marketing department. I'm doing air quotes here while I say well, that. You can do one too. PFF Mike. Yeah, put in PFF Mike if you want. It'll be free. You'll probably have <laughs> to still pay full price if you put PFF Mike in there. Just so send try, it to me. I'll give you a login. If you try remember. PFF Steve because we're still a business. No, really. We appreciate everybody listening. It was a record bump. Draft Pass has been great. The podcast has been great. The we'll draft be has been fun. Recap pods as soon as the draft ends. Yeah, so recap pause right after the draft. And draft pass, by the way, will update with our analysis of the picks. So how do they fit with your team? We're going to rejig the whole thing so you can check out all your picks in one section. That's also the value of draft pass. But just get it early so you're ready for the draft. Good stuff, Mike. That's it. Hope you guys enjoyed. Have a good draft. Happy drafting. We're all winning championships here.